Welcome back. In this video, we're going to go over a model to show you how you can detect the likelihood of fraud. Once again, the most, mod, uh, the most modern uh, model, um, th this is a very hot area of research, are more likely to use more sophisticated technique uh, such as um, nonlinear model or machine learning. Um, so any big data model that help us um, understand or detect the likelihood of fraud. This is uh, a relatively old model, uh, but it's very simple. Um, and we can use it as a as a example. Um, those the variables are based on intuition. Um, these are all accounting uh, financial statements only uh, item. Um, most likely, um, you will also include non-financial statement item in a more comprehensive model. But the approach uh, we can we can look at how we go about doing this. So this model was developed by Banish and um, their co-author. So they use data from firms that has been subject to SEC enforcement actions. Um, so these are all firms that have committed fraud. And then they look at the relationship between um, some accounting um, variables um, and their likelihood of um, being uh, subject to those actions. So the eight factor model um, identify uh, financial characteristics for firms that are most likely to engage in earning, earnings manipulation. Um, the statistical model they use is a probit model. A probit model um, measures the probability of an event occurring. As I said, that's just one of many different model. Uh, the discussion of uh, how to use big data to help us identify these um, items is definitely beyond the scope of this class, but we can use the output of those big data model um, in 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 our analysis, so we are we're using model that has been uh, tested. So here are the uh, factors that they has identified: they, they sales in receivable. Uh, the way that he approaches, he called this an index. An index is they use current years sales days sales in receivable divided by last year's days sales in receivables. Uh, gross margin index, they used last year divided by the current year. So they also in their paper explain further why they do this. Um, and um, you can also uh, take a look at the reasoning. Um, so uh, asset quality, uh, this is the, um, so high quality assets are current assets of cash um, and um, Fix that uh, plant planning equipment because those are assets that we that's more tangible. Um, so asset quality measures the um, how much of the low quality asset is relative to um, to the overall asset of the firm. Uh, I want to emphasize that the detailed description of this is in the textbook. So make sure that you read the textbook too, uh, so that you can uh, get the full description of how to compute this. Uh, sales growth is just uh, current year over last year. Depreciation index is uh, scale by total uh, by plan, um, property planning equipment. So all these are scale. So these are scale by total asset. And then SGNA expense is uh, scaled by sales. And then leverage, again, is um, total liability, so current plus long-term liability divided by total asset. And then total accrual to total asset. Uh, that is not an index, that's just an absolute number. So looking at why do you have last year versus current year or current year versus last year, you'll see that if this is an increase, so increasing in sales in receivable is a bad thing, right? Increase in gross margin is a good thing, but a decrease is a bad thing. So anything, so we want last year divided by current, so that will become a decrease. Um, so the same thing as the quality, um, decreasing is a bad thing. Um, or increasing low quality is a bad thing. Uh, sales growth. Um, and then depreciation, again, increasing is a bad thing. So you can see why they use last year versus current year. And then finally, to put all these together, 
This is the estimate, so this is the constant. The constant is point, negative 0.484. And then the coefficient for the day sales and receivable index is 0.92. Uh, for the gross margin index, the coefficient is 0.58, and so forth. So we are um, to apply this model. I've created an Excel template uh, for Enron. So go ahead and pause the video and download the Excel template for Enron. And we'll then continue um, the demonstration on how to use this model to estimate the probability or the likelihood of fraud. Right, so here are the numbers. We're going to switch over to Excel. OK, are you ready? So I included some intermediate calculation in this template. So these are the information that we extracted from the financial statements. Um, these are some intermediate calculations. And then this is the model. So we have the coefficient. Um, these are from the formula. So remember that. So first, let's compute the day's sales in receivable. Uh, day sales in receivable is equal to um, accounts receivable uh, divided by sales. So that's technically not day sales in receivable. We actually still have to divide this by um, 365, uh, but uh, or multiply this by 365. Um, but because 365 is a constant, we just ignore that in the in the equation. Uh, gross margin is sales minus cost of goods sold divided by sales. The author called this the asset quality ratio. It's actually poor asset quality ratio. It's 1 minus the good, good ratio. So it's equal to 1 minus the sum of current asset and property plan and equipment divided by total assets. So that means um, the low quality asset represents 35 or 36%. And then depreciation is equal to depreciation expense scaled by um, the sum of depreciation and property plan and equipment. Uh, SGNA ratio, so that's just SGNA divided by sales. The leverage ratio is total, li total liability, so we have current liability and long term debt together divided by total assets. And then finally, we have total accruals to total asset. So we have a proxy for accrual is the difference between income and cash flow. So we take income from, uh, income from operation minus cash flow from operation and divide that by total asset. So here we have the intermediate calculation. Once again, uh, the formulas for this is in the textbook. So make sure that you um, you you summarize that. Um, again, if you don't um, remember this, um, refer to the textbook for the details. Uh, once we have computed that for one year, we can copy that to all the years. Now that we have finished the intermediate calculation, we can um, compute the equation. So the first item is a constant. Uh, we already have the coefficient there, so the constant is just by itself. Uh, next, we have day sales and receivable index. Remember that is the current divided by last year. So current is 2000, last year is 1999, and we have to multiply that by the coefficient. Uh, because the coefficient doesn't change, it's always column E, I'll put that in there. Um, actually, we need to do that here as well. The coefficient doesn't change. Okay. Uh, gross margin, remember that's last year, so 1999, divided by the current year, times, once again, the coefficient. And asset quality is current, so 2000, divided by 1999. 
and multiply that by coefficient. Sales growth, sales growth is just current sales divided by previous sales. So, and then multiply that by the coefficient. Uh, depreciation index is last year, so 1999, divided by current year. And once again, include the coefficient. SGNA is current year, so current year SGNA divided by last year times the coefficient. And then leverage is current divided by last year times the coefficient. Okay. And total accrual is not an index, so it's just the uh, computed value times the coefficient. So what we have computed here is the formula. So we have compute. We have the uh, uh, we have the uh, constant term, and then we have computed each of those individual terms. And in order to um, compute the y value, we'll have to add all of these terms up. Just to notice that the negative here, that's already included in the coefficient. So, so the negative sign is incorporated in the coefficient here. So now we can compute the estimated y value of that model, which is just the sum of all these items that we have computed. Finally, we can estimate the probability of fraud or manipulation. So we're going to use a function called the standard normal distribution in Excel. Uh, so it's this one, so normal standard distribution. And we'll put the estimated y, uh, y value there. So once we compute the 2000, we can copy it to the last two, the next two years. So we see that in, two, in 1988, the probability of manipulation was 0.87%, so very low, 0.9%. Uh, it's increased a little bit in 1999, and you make a huge jump to 2000. Uh, in addition to the probability, the change is also very important. So here, um, there's definitely cause for concern um, to investigate a lot more into em Enron's um, accounting process. This concludes um, chapter six. I will see you all again soon in the next chapter.